Jeff Fett Hughes Syndrome, we're talking about science fiction movies. Hello and welcome to the show, welcome to Huber Syndrome. I was watching Stranger Things recently, like uh, I'm sure many of you were. The zeitgeist was too powerful to ignore. Uh, so it made me think about science fiction, the origins of my science fiction love. We're gonna jump right into it with a few key movies from my life. So we're talking about science fiction movies. I know I'm wearing this Oblivion shirt. I just, I got it for free. That's why I'm wearing it. I'm not some like Oblivion, oh man, that's some good sci-fi. No, 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 no. So let's jump right into it. You know, I love a good story. So it's time for some story time. Settle in, kick back, grab your soda, coffee, beverage of your choice. It's time for trip down memory lane. It all started when I was entirely too young to be watching these types of science fiction films, but I was about eight or nine years old, give or take a year or two, uh, when I was just casually minding my own business, sitting in my room as a kid, probably playing like Sega Genesis or something, Streets of Rage, doors shut, all of a sudden it slams open, kaboosh, in walks Paul Huber, my father. He says, son, you gotta check this out. I say, dad, you give me a heart attack, what's going on? He's like, check this out. Inserts a VHS tape into my VCR, already queued up to the precise moment when the queen alien sticks her tail through Bishop, raises him 50 feet in the air and rips him in half. From that moment on, I was hooked. I needed to consume every bit of alien space, sci-fi, space marine lore there was. So Aliens and uh, my father really uh, kicked off this obsession. Uh, Aliens is without a doubt my favorite film of all time. Uh, you know, there's always a debate between one and two. I love them both uh, pretty much equally. Yeah, going through all of that franchise, and uh, along with Star Wars as well, just being able to go through a saga of films, not unlike TV today, that continuity that I'm always talking about, uh, is definitely one of my favorite franchises growing up. All the aliens, even three. Three's weird, it's fine. Watch the director's cut though, David Fincher. Uh, it's definitely more tolerable, much better film. Alien 3 director's cut. So next on the list, we could have just called this 80s Cronenberg science fiction. We're jumping into the fly. So sit back, grab your coffee, your beverage, your soda, whatever it is, it's time for trip down memory lane. Growing up with my brother, uh, my grandma used to live with us and take care of us, drive us to school and uh, look after us, you know, we used to go to Burger King. Never forget when we went to Burger King and she bought an extra hamburger. We said, Grandma, we only need two. Who's that one for? That's for Tessie. Tessie's our dog. You know, she bought a burger at Wendy's, gave it to the dog. We're off track though. Uh, used to watch a lot of movies at home, you know, just skimming through the channels, what not, what have you. I can remember we landed on The Fly. David Cronenberg's The Fly. Now the original uh, black and white fly still gives me nightmares to this day, even though the effects are terrible. It's a really old movie. Uh, you know, the, the fly uh, face is clearly a helmet on this guy, but there's something about giant fly eyes that haunts my nightmares to this day. It freaks me out. Like planet Earth and stuff, close ups of insects and flies, they give me the willies. But Cronenberg, master of body horror, took this into another level. One of the things that makes The Fly so effective for me is how realistic it is. It is a believable premise. I just buy into it every step of the way. Jeff Goldblum makes these teleporting pods. He's some like crazy Rain Man mathematician. And it's realistic. It's like pod A breaks down your body's cellular structure and rebuilds it in pod two. Seems plausible. Well, a fly gets in there 
and it breaks it and molds it into one. And what follows is some of the most disturbing, intense, revolting imagery I have ever seen in a movie. It just made me realize that movies could be disgusting. It was the first disgusting movie I had ever seen. Again, I was like eight or nine, 10 years old, way too young, way too young to be watching this thing. And it made my imagination just soar. The stakes keep raising and the situation becomes more dire as time goes on. And just throughout this movie, that slow transformation, uh, it's unnerving to watch and extremely unsettling. And I just love that Gina Davis, uh, Jeff Goldblum's girlfriend in the movie, kind of represents the audience where she keeps coming and checking in on him. And each check-in with Goldblum is just more sinister than the last. And it's just such an adult film. It's not about good people doing good things and fighting evil and prevailing in the end. It's about a man that believes in his cause so passionately and is so blinded by it that ultimately, you know, it doesn't go well. Spoilers. <laughs> Next up on the list, I wanna credit my good friend, Nick Bellinger on this one uh, for really, you know, the door into science fiction was open for me with aliens and uh, the fly and, and so forth. But he really came and just kicked that door wide open when he showed me the reanimator. Fans of Lovecraft might not be too pleased I'm talking about this one because it is an adaptation of the master's work. A uh, loose adaptation, I should say that. But this movie lit a fire under me like no other. I'm getting ready to go to San Francisco State University for college. My friend, movie man Nick, is moving to LA for film school, doing his thing. He's got a billion DVDs. He throws on Reanimator, and this movie just lights a fire under me like no other. I end up moving to San Francisco, and what do I find up there? An amoeba. I don't know if you've heard of amoeba. There's one in Berkeley, there's one in San Francisco, and there's one in Los Angeles. You go in this store as a fan of music, film, or both, prepare to spend all of your money and lose all of your time. It is like a paradise, an oasis, in a desert with just rows and stacks and piles and mounds of the most obscure movies, current event movies, every single movie you've ever dreamed of, movies you're not even looking for are staring at you in the face. So after I watch Reanimator, you know, which is ahead of its time, by the way, it's a movie about zombies, basically. But again, just like The Fly, it's all about that plausible plot. The one that I'm buying into. It's not like, hey, there's zombies, you know, they're coming back to life. How? Why? What? Why should I be invested? What? Oh, it's zombies. No, Reanimator is about a scientist trying to bring the dead back to life, but on that journey, he brings them back dead. It's basically a dark comedy, but with just a ton of gore. And that is something that I didn't get to bring up to in the fly, is just before CG, before the rise of CG, when life was simpler and we had practical effects, this gore just meant so much more. Yes, that rhymes, but it's true. Gore means more. And it, it just sucks me into these movies. I mean, the giant animatronic queen alien in Aliens. Compare that to the queen alien in Aliens vs. Predator. It's not even a comparison. That CG schlock in that movie compared to the real deal. Nothing beats real. So I credit Reanimator with uh, lighting the fire under me and going to Amoeba every day in San Francisco and just picking up stacks of used DVDs for like $4 each. And uh, you know, the rest is history. Last on my list. <laughs> oh, the weirdest, the weirdest movie of the bunch. I've brought this up a couple times. 
but I'm talking to you right now, everyone. I implore you to check this movie out because it is freaky, it is bizarre, and I thought about it more than once while I was watching Stranger Things. This movie is called The Brood. Now this is another David Cronenberg uh, masterpiece, unsung masterpiece, and it is about, similar to Stranger Things, it is about a uh, psychiatrist in kind of a secure facility doing some experiments on, uh, on a patient who happens to be uh, the main character's wife. They're, you know, going through some hard times. She's in his psychiatric care and, you know, things, things are getting mysterious. Things are not going as they seem. How do I talk about this movie without giving away plot details? Uh, again, it's before CG, so there are just some really nasty special effects and uh, practical effects in this movie. And again, it is David Cronenberg's wheelhouse, talking about that body horror. We've been talking about scientists all episode, it's so fitting. It's you combine these ingredients and make this concoction of psychological horror and deeply disturbing imagery you fuse that up and you give me something I'll never forget. And that is the case with The Brood. Check it out. It'll have your mind just in circles, spinning, racing. That's it for the episode. Stranger Things, awesome show. Just got me thinking about the glory days and my love and my origins of science fiction. Uh, if you haven't seen any of those movies, I definitely recommend each and every one of them. Nature of Huber Syndrome, we can never talk about them all. There's a million I want to talk about. But that's what Talking Syndrome is for. Join me 11 a.m. on Saturdays in Easy Allies Twitch, where we talk in detail about the episode. And I pretty much just ask you your favorite science fiction movies. Uh, let me go. Let me go. Let me know if the 80s are the glory days, or if we're in a resurgence and the best is yet to come. See you next week. It's time for the syndrome. I was going to talk about Scanners or Terminator 2 or something epic, but I reached in and I saw that this District 9 box had a playable God of War 3 demo on it, and I couldn't resist. <laughs>